Hello and welcome to the latest installment of the Decameron in Times of Coronavirus. My name is Liz Spragans. I am an assistant professor of Spanish at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. And today I'm excited to be talking to you about uh, one story from a collection of stories that you've already heard a little bit about from Emily and Brian. Um, the title has been translated as The Disenchantments of Love and was written by the most prominent female writer of 17th century Spain, Maria de Zayas. The Disenchantments of Love, or as it is known in the original Spanish, Los Desengaños Amorosos, participates in the same frame tale tradition of which Boccaccio's Decameron forms an important part and was published in 1647. Sayas really committed to her framing story, and the Desengaños actually forms the second installment of a frame tale that was begun 10 years earlier in a collection of stories called the Novelas Ejemplares y Amorosas. I should begin this video with a warning that the story that I'll be discussing today contains graphic descriptions of murder in a domestic space, and so some viewers might want to stop watching once I get into the specifics of the story's plot about 10 minutes in. Um, I'm going to first tell you a bit more about that frame in a moment, but first I want to tell you a bit about Sayas herself. We know very little about Sayas beyond that she lived in Spain during the first half of the 17th century. She was from Madrid, and she may have spent some part of her life in Spanish Naples in Italy. And she was almost certainly a member of the upper class, and we know this because of the depth of learning that she demonstrates in her stories. Uh, the class sympathies that she displays in those stories, and then the, also the environs that she's representing in them. Um, she belonged to a generation of authors approximately one generation younger than that of the two most famous early modern Spanish authors, the novelist Miguel de Cervantes and the great playwright Lope de Vega. Um, we know that she was an active participant in Madrid's intellectual life during the second quarter of the 17th century, uh, since the great Lope himself praised her as the so-called 10th muse, and we know that she participated in a tribute to him in 1636. Like Cervantes and Lope, Sayas's generation of writers was still grappling with what it meant to be a professional author and to retain economic control over one's text and characters. Unlike her contemporaries, however, she also had to deal with what it meant to be a female professional author. In effect, uh, the process of publication meant exposing herself to the public space, which is a particularly problematic position for a woman to choose to put herself in at this time. One of the key tools that Sias uses to talk about being a woman in the early modern Mediterranean is through the frame that she uses for both the novelas ejemplares y amorosas and the desengaños. And as Emily and Brian mentioned in their earlier video, the collection mimics its model, the Decameron, and explains that the need for these stories arose from an outbreak of disease. Rather than a widespread epidemic that led to the Decameron, however, this disease is more local and domesticated. The protagonist of the frame tale in both collections, named Lysis, uh, at the beginning of the novelas ejemplares y amorosas, had been spurned by her lover, Don Juan, who had transferred his interest to her cousin, Lisarda. Heartbroken, Lysis becomes ill, which is a normal response to unrequited love in the literature of the time, and her friends and mother decide to throw a series of parties over Christmas to distract her from her illness. At each party, in addition to music, dancing, singing, and feasting, the guests take turns telling stories about love. And by the end of the novelas ejemplares y amorosas, another man, Don Diego, has further complicated the love triangle by successfully courting Lysis. Her illness, however, lingers until she finally recovers over a year later, and then Diego and Lysis can finally start really planning their marriage. And so the Desengaños shows another series of storytelling parties thrown a year after the original collection that are supposed to lead up to this wedding. The story that I'm going to talk about today, as I have said, comes from this second collection of stories. 
And while the novelas ejemplares y amorosas occasionally leave open the possibility that love can uh, end in happy resolution, the desengaños, the disenchantments, as its name suggests, is really committed to disabusing its listeners within the frame tail and then also its readers in the world of the possibility of happy endings for women who fall in love with men. You might expect there to be less violence in these feminine domestic spaces, but instead what you get is a domestication of violence that's just as brutal and unremitting. Like disease, the domestication of the travails of the outside world doesn't mean that these problems are lessened. If anything, the containment of these problems within the domestic sphere pressurizes them, raises the stakes, and makes the outcomes even more extreme. The Desengaños are a collection of 10 gruesome tales that again and again show innocent women who are abused by the men in their lives. Husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, lovers. Six of the stories end with the death of at least one female protagonist at the hands of her protector, while the other four show their female protagonists being forced to seek haven in a convent and to disavow the world of men entirely. As exemplary stories, the clear pedagogical message seems to be that women should avoid the company of men at all costs, or risk often fatal consequences of participating in a patriarchal society. The listener would be forgiven for asking why on earth they should want to read such depressing literature, particularly at such a dark time in our history, and my first frank answer is that you might want to wait for a particularly sunny day to dive into either collection. Um, but my second answer is that for all of their darkness, Sias's stories are really masterpieces of their genre and succeed in repeatedly highlighting female agency and resilience in desperately circumscribed situations, some of which Emily and Brian already talked about in the last installment of this series. Um, and it's particularly interesting to watch how the relationships among women develop and sort of unify them as a, a group of people that are sharing a moment of suffering. And I think that that sort of model is an interesting thing to contemplate at this particular time in history. So with that rather lengthy introduction to the collection as a whole, I'm now going to turn to the story that I'd like to talk about with you today, The Traitor to His Own Blood in Spanish, El Traidor Contra Su Sangre. This story is framed by one of the guests, Doña Francisca, as a lesson on men's fickleness and appetites and tells of two episodes of feminicide in the family of a man named Don Pedro. Don Pedro has two children, Doña Mencia and Don Alonso, and is basically the walking stereotype of a golden age Spanish patriarch. He's completely obsessed with status. He's completely obsessed with the purity of his family's blood, with wealth, and is unapologetically merciless in doing whatever it takes to preserve those. Strangely, Don Pedro has decided that his daughter is not allowed to marry anyone, no matter how wealthy, and plans to settle his entire estate upon his son Alonso and to ship Mencia off to a convent as soon as she hits a marriageable age. As we'll see in retrospect, this might have actually been the best option for her, but unfortunately she doesn't get a chance to avail herself of it. Because, as the narrator tells us, of course she was beautiful because she had to be unfortunate. She's a little bit too attractive for her own good. Um, and so a wealthy and honorable man named Don Enrique falls in love with her and wants to marry her, but he's not Christ, so he doesn't meet Don Pedro's standards for his daughter's husband. Furthermore, the narrator tells us that his background just isn't up to Don Pedro's standards, saying the reason for this was some knowledge of a stain against Don Enrique's blood, of which Don Pedro was not unaware, for, to tell the truth, Don Enrique's grandparents were simple farmers, a fault that was compensated by their being old Christians which, with such immense wealth that it wasn't hard for them to cover up their origi origins. Excuse me. Long story short, Don Enrique succeeds in wooing Doña Mencia by sending her letters through servants and singing songs and poems composed just for her while strolling up, a, up and down her street at night. <clears throat> 
They secretly get married through the window grating of Doña Mencia's house with their servants as witnesses, and then start to try to think of a way to actually get to cohabitate. Unfortunately for the lovers, Don Enrique had previously been involved with a woman named Clavella, who is described as being married, but of free and loose habits. Um, and this is sort of an, uh, a string that doesn't ever get tied up. We don't know what happened with them. Um, and this is a thing that Sias likes to do a lot, where she likes to uh, include undeveloped stories that we can speculate upon, but don't quite know. Uh, Clavella also happens to be friends with two other upper-class women with, quote, loose morals, uh, who are described as not comporting themselves as befitted their blood and receiving visitors at the expense of their reputation. They also happen to be friends with Don Alonso and Doña Mencia, which is really bad news for Don Enrique and Doña Mencia. And I want to stop here and point out the slipperiness of this concept of blood as a marker of honor and status in this story. We already know from the title, Traitor to His Blood, that blood will be a key concept throughout this story. And here we have the first stab, if you'll forgive my pun, at setting up first what blood signifies, and then by extension suggesting what it might mean to betray that blood. Don Pedro's concept of blood here tracks with notions of blood purity that were a widespread concern in early modern Spain. In the 15th century, Spanish identity began to be consolidated as specifically Catholic. Think Spanish Inquisition here, um, particularly in the latter part of the 15th century into the 16th century, to the exclusion of people with Muslim and Christian backgrounds and Jewish backgrounds that had previously lived throughout the Iberian Peninsula. And a policy of unification began to cement a division between old Christians, those who could trace Christian heritage back through history, and new Christians, those of Muslim or Jewish descent, who had converted to Christianity only recently. And this latter heterogeneous group was generally seen as being socially inferior to old Christians, regardless of their often superior economic status and were frequently accused of being heretics, of practicing their former religions in secret, and of trying to convert others to those heresies. Um, and an additional allegation that was starting to happen in the 17th century is that converso, or convert families, were often accused of buying their way into positions of influence as the Spanish state began to fail economically. And so there's an implication here that maybe Don Enrique's family doesn't have the heritage that it claims to have, but they have enough money to cover up their, their baser, um, all scare quotes intended, uh, origins. In addition to these religious concerns, another major social issue that is widely discussed in early modern Spanish literature is family honor, a quality that is primarily vested in the careful management of the sexuality of female members of the family. In Spanish comedias, the wildly popular dramas of the day, most famously those written by Sias's contemporary Pedro Calderón de la Barca, Aggrieved husbands are portrayed as murdering their wives in private revenge for dishonor brought upon their houses. The most famous of these is Calderón's 1637 play, El Médico de Su Honra, The Doctor of His Honor, several of whose protagonists coincidentally have the same names as the characters in Sias' story. Pedro, Enrique, and Mencia are three of the major characters in the Calderón play. And in Calderón's plays, Characters are driven mad by jealousy, and bloodshed is represented as being the only solution to the irreparable harm that has been done to the family honor, usually by the implication of a wife in um, some sort of extramarital affair. As we'll see, Sias rewrites this trope from the perspective of women whose blood is shed in the name of protecting family honor. To return to the story, Theoretically, then, the reason that Don Pedro objects to Don Enrique as a suitor for his daughter, other than the fact that he's not a convent, is the possibility that Don Enrique would pollute his noble blood with his baser blood and thus dishonor the family. And yet, as we very quickly see with the behavior of Alonso and Clavela's friends, noble birth by no means guarantees a family's honor, nor the good behavior of its women. 
Um, so we find out that Don Alonso has long been trying to get with Glavella, but that she has spurned his advances thus far because she's been shacking up with Don Enrique. Um, now jilted in favor of Alonso's sister, however, Clavella changes her tune and uses her new intimacy with Alonso to let him know what his sister is up to, something that, worst news of all to Alonso's ears, is publicly known. And the narrator tells us that this made Don Alonso so mad that he could hardly utter a reply. Blind with rage at his sister's looseness and at Don Enrique's audacity, he was unable to contain his wrath. The ill-advised ladies were powerless to restrain him, particularly since they had, in fact, been hoping to incite just such a rage in him. And here the narrator seems to really be hammering home one of her key take-home messages for her, her partially female audience, that awakening the wrath of a man is a dangerous thing to do as a woman, regardless of whether you're initially doing it to serve your own purposes. It's a Pandora's box that can't ever be closed back up. And this Pandora's box is full of gruesome, gory details. Don Alonso tells his father what he has heard, and the two men conspire to kill, to kill Doña Mencia in vengeance. Don Pedro, who for some reason doesn't want to participate in this, uh, goes away to Seville, and this is perhaps again a nod to Calderón's El Médico de Su Honra, which uh, has, begins with a scene of, of the character there, Pedro, going off to Seville while Don Alonso stays home to monitor his sister's behavior. He manages to catch her writing a letter to Enrique, locks her in her chamber while he goes to find a priest to confess her so that she'll go to heaven when he kills her, uh, and then he finally murders her by stabbing her repeatedly. Uh, he locks the door again and allows Doña Mencia's letter to then be delivered to Don Enrique. Later that evening, Don Enrique comes to their house for his tryst with Doña Mencia and approaches the same window grating at which they were married. He knocks and gets no response until suddenly the shutters fling open and he sees Doña Mencia's corpse illuminated by this miraculous light, still bleeding from the wounds that her brother inflicted on it more than 11 hours earlier and they're very specific about the times at which these events are taking place. The cadaver speaks and warms him away. And nevertheless, Don Alonso and a friend are lying in wait, and they stab him, and again, this number is really specific, they stab him 23 times exactly. Um, miraculously, he actually survives um, and is able to send the authorities to discover Doña Mencia's body and to try and track down Don Alonso. They find the body still bleeding, and it's now been almost 24 hours. And a signed note from Don Alonso, which states matter-of-factly, quote, I killed her so that my noble blood would not be mingled with the commoners. Eventually, Don Alonso makes his escape to Italy, um, while Don Enrique gives his entire estate to a monastery where he buries his dead wife's corpse and then enters it as a monk. So I'm emphasizing all of this graphic violence in part to show what a far cry these stories, often dismissed as women's literature, are from the sheltered, genteel sort of storytelling that we might expect from an author that is a Spanish noblewoman of this time period. The details are so vivid and brutal that it's nearly impossible to get some of these images out of your head once they're there. What I find fascinating about Doña Mencia in the first part of The Traitor Against His Own Blood, however, is how unruly this confined woman manages to be in spite of her so-called protector's best efforts. Um, She's a, she's a docile, obedient woman who is characterized as abiding by the Spanish obsession with domestic privacy, even in death. And she only crosses the domestic threshold to be buried first in a temporary grave, and then goes to her final rec resting place in Enrique's newly endowed monastery as a virgin. And yet, she not only manages to meet someone to love and marry him, but also succeeds in speaking from beyond the grave to clearly direct the authorities to her murderer. It remains unexplored whether her marriage with Enrique would have led, led to a happy ending. Given his dalliances with Calavella and the, the context of the other stories in the collection, it seems pretty unlikely. Um, but it's left, open, it's left open as a possibility. Um, the blood that Don Pedro and Don Alonso were so intent on protecting from contamination by mixing with Don Enrique's common blood pours everywhere her body goes because she keeps bleeding even a year after her murder. 
And so the substance that her father and brother have been so stingy with, enforcing its enclosure within Doña Mencia's chaste and contained body, runs out just uncontrollably once they decide to spill it in vengeance. Um, her blood wells out in this promiscuous tide of legible ink that writes the story of her death at the hands of these powerful men. As I've mentioned, this bloodshed's not particularly unusual for the literature of Sias's time, this idea of feminicide as a, as a way of coping with dishonor. But it takes on a different inflection in Sias's take on feminicide. So if Calderon's honor plays claustrophobically paint his female characters into inescapable corners doomed by their own dishonorable behavior, Sias's dramatic portrayals of domestic violence undermine the validity of the social system that portrays this violence as just. Each tale reveals how barbaric it is um, to follow this honor code to its logical limits. And in the traitor to his own blood, the violence that is intended to confine, contain, and forever silence a woman results in an outpouring of that most unruly of Galenic humors, gushing blood from a female body that, like her voice, won't just stop not even in death. Uh, I've run on a little bit long here, so I'm gonna stop retelling this story, but I really encourage you to seek out a copy of the Desengaños and find out what happens in the second half of the story when Don Alonso goes into exile in, in Italy, what the fate of the second woman in his family is, and how even in a society doing everything in its power to keep her down, this woman and other women managed to nevertheless persist. Thank you and please enjoy. <laughs>